increasingly, we're seeing the effects of climate change pop up in every aspect of life. But it's not all extreme weather and clean energy initiatives. Climate change affects all life on Earth, from the depths of the ocean all the way to your kitchen. Let's consider the marine food web. The climate crisis affects the quality of our ocean waters. The temperature, the salinity, even the currents themselves are shifting. And these changes have catastrophic impacts on the marine organisms that sustain both humans and wildlife. See, over 3 billion people worldwide rely on food from the ocean as a staple in their diet. And many non-human species base their entire life cycles on marine food availability as well. Take sea and shorebirds. They feed on small fish and invertebrates from the sunny surface waters to the mysterious seafloor, the Pacific zone. In these ways, nutrients from the seafloor sustain life throughout the water column and into the world of water. We'll learn more from experts on climate change, marine ecosystems, sea and shorebirds, and sustainable fishing. Let's explore how climate change affects the food web and food availability for marine organisms, birds, and humans alike. The Earth's climate is now changing faster than at any point in the history of modern civilization, and that's primarily as a result of human activities. It manifests as changes in precipitation, changes in ocean and air circulation patterns, melting of ice caps, which then drives sea level rise. I tend to think of it as this trickle-down effect or this cascade effect. You have the climate impact, which is affects the ecosystem and affects the species, and eventually it trickles to our human uses as well. So there is a really, really tight tie in between how the forage fish are doing and the water temperature and the acidity of the Arctic Ocean and how the birds are doing. In the, uh, in the Arctic, uh, places like Greenland, there's the impact on ice. We have sea ice shelves that uh, sit over water and if, if those are melted or if those are just not present for the majority of the year, that has a direct impact on the life that lives under it. It also has an impact on the accessibility of those areas to things like fishing vessels. The seafood is uh, enormously important. Fisheries uh, is a very, very large industry and I think on a global on a global scale, if we didn't have fishery, there would be a severe lack of, uh, of food in, in many places. In terms of uh, warming in the Arctic, we are seeing, you know, an increase in stream temperatures that can push some species to their uh, to their limits. So we have seen, you know, areas of large die-offs, but then, you know, there's also a question of can and will those um, fish move elsewhere. When a changing habitat forces a species to move, this creates a ripple effect felt across the food web. Many um, marine organisms are adapted to a particular temperature range. They are kind of like they're in their Goldilocks zone. This temperature is just right for us. As, that, as the temperature changes, so these things that are kind of uh, living on the seabed find, or actually anywhere else in the sea, find that the water temperature isn't right for them. And the kind of classic response is that, you, that they stop living in the areas that's become too hot, and uh, they uh, migrate to areas that's more in, the, in their um, core temperature zone. And we've seen that, and that's been recorded for lots and lots of different uh, organisms all over the ocean. The benthic area, the area kind of just above the seabed, is a really important part of marine systems. There are lots of animals that live uh, on or even uh, under the seabed, kind of burrow in or they sit on top of the seabed. And uh, these can uh, create a lot of uh, diverse, um, um, uh, from my perspective, very interesting and uh, beautiful habitats. Animals move up and down in the water column that they kind of move to access food and then they move down to maybe get some um, shelter. Common eiders and also king eiders are marine birds and they spend almost 95% of their life at sea, completely away from the coastline. And they're diving all the way down to the bottom to the benthic and they're eating bivalves, they're eating mollusks and they're eating urchins. They're diving all the way down to the bottom. And there is some concern that there's been um, a population switch between what varieties of bivalves are available to them and how easy they are to digest and what the nutritional value is. There is a ton of concern about forage fish in uh, northern Alaska because we have these very big seabird colonies such as puffins and there are fulmars and there are mirrors and they feed on forage fish. 
And uh, that's, so that's like little fish, not this big usually. The problem is with the warming ocean, especially what has been called the blob in the North Pacific, is driving those fish too deep for the birds to die. And so there has been total colony failure, colony collapse, tons and tons of dead seabirds washing up on the shores in Alaska. So how the birds fit into the Arctic food web is going to differ depending on which species of bird we're talking about, since some of them are eating things like bivalves and some of them are eating fish. Humans are definitely fitting into this food web. So there's this, there's this kind of natural link between uh, the, the seabed and, and higher up in, in the water column. The, these habitats, they, they can be important nurseries for lots of species, including commercially um, fish, fish and crustaceans. In Greenland, where I work, uh, the, uh, the two biggest uh, um, fisheries are for the cold water prawn, which live on the seabed, and the Greenland halibut also live on the seabed. So we are directly linked to this food chain because we're catching those shrimp and those halibut and eating them. So the cold water prawns and the, and the Greenland halibut, these are the two major fisheries uh, in Greenland. The change that's been more, most obvious during the last five or ten years has been the, the, the cold water prawn stock in West Greenland. The prawns have uh, been moving north towards uh, colder waters. So the, the, the fishery has, has also, of course, uh, changed uh, location according to, to, the, to the weather. The fishery is immensely important to, uh, to Greenland, not only as a food source, but, but uh, primarily as an economic uh, source to the, to the society. Uh, approximately 90% of uh, the national income in Greenland uh, come from, uh, from fisheries. WCS and ZSL scientists are working hard to study the trophic levels of the marine food web and understand how to best sustain it. We really try and identify gaps in um, knowledge and so that we can provide the best possible data and information to managers. And I really think that we do that. So um, the decision makers can say, well, these shorebirds are endangered and they prefer this type of habitat. They breed in these areas. This is a particularly sensitive time. We should avoid this area during this time period. We are um, documenting um, life on the seabed around Greenland uh, by doing uh, uh, deep sea camera surveys. And we're doing that so that we can uh, assess the uh, impact of uh, uh, activities such as trawling on the seabed and so that we can then provide that information to relevant authorities and uh, fishing organisations to um, essentially allow them to operate more sustainably. A sustainable fishery, fishery is, is uh, the, your fishery is within the limits of the, of the standard and you don't cause any harm to the to the to the stock or to the the uh, the surrounding environment or the seabed the marine stewardship council that's uh, the largest sustainability brand within the fishing fishery industry the msc standard that's what the the sales departments at at, at polar seafood and, and royal greenland that's what uh, the the customers demand from them our scientists and researchers have identified the most fragile species and habitats across marine ecosystems and helped fisheries achieve greater sustainability. When times change, and that's how it's always is, some stocks go up and some stocks go down and then they fluctuate again, uh, but, but uh, they have to be able to adapt also to, for example, climate change or new species or something like that. The more that we understand life on the seabed and the consequences of, of, of our actions are having, then the better placed we are to be able to manage them and preserve um, what we've got left. More understanding gives us a, a better tool set to be able to know what's effective and what's not effective in our, in our strategies.